2021. So happy new year to everybody. Uh, I am Marta Great. Keen. Great. What what is your what is your email address? Um, we're going to be muting everyone. And if you'd like to communicate in the chat, please feel free. Uh, if you want to identify yourself or have a question. Oh. Go. Ah, I got muted. All right. I'm sorry. Take, about that. That's, that's fine. We're going to take questions at the end. Uh, Gloria is going to be recording this for us. It will be available uh, within probably uh, a couple of weeks. Um, we're looking at ways to make it available to members only uh, or people who've registered. Uh, if you miss it today or there's something you want to rewatch, that will be available. And then eventually it'll be available to anyone on our YouTube channel. So we're working on that. But uh, let us know if you have any problems. The way that the format is today, uh, we are going to be having five speakers and they will be introducing themselves as well as the organizations that they are with. They'll be giving you a background on their perspective from their organization on glass recycling. We have a few prepared questions that I'll be asking at the end. And then uh, I will have uh, uh, some questions that come in through the chat. So again, we're encouraging that. Uh, so yeah, that uh, if you would just follow along, the last thing I wanted to mention before we get started is next month, uh, we are going to be having a residential electronics recycling uh, educational program with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. This is scheduled the third week of February. We're literally haven't figured out which day of that week, but we're working on it. It is going to be free for the government folks because we're trying to encourage everybody who has any interest in joining the state's electronic program to join. And we are, of course, as always, are welcoming sponsors. And speaking of which, we have three esteemed sponsors today that we want to thank. We have Owens, Illinois, okay, or OI, which was founded by Michael Owens over a century ago, and he changed the way that glass was produced. He automated a lot of uh, the processes and innovated. And today there are 25,000 employees that work with customers and partners partners to define the future of glass. There are 1,800 active patents on proprietary technology. Uh, and O&I remains dedicated to the qualities that have endeared Mr. Owens to glass in the first place. It's beauty, versatility, and endless sustainability. Our second sponsor is Foam Cycle. Foam Cycle is an early stage recycling company that is pioneering a unique closed foam recycling system to help solve the foam problem. So they are actually trying to find municipal, county, university locations to put in their densifying equipment and work with you to encourage foam recycling drop-offs. Lastly, we have strategic materials, which anybody involved with selling glass is well aware of strategic materials. Um, they process glass and plastic for use in a wide array of products, creating efficiencies for customers while conserving the Earth's natural resources. They also got their start over 100 years ago in 1896. Um, and currently, they are merged with Next Cycle, a glass and plastic recycling business in Ontario, Canada. They've also acquired Container Recycling Alliance, which has increased their presence across the United States. They are focused on creating value for their customers through innovation and customer improvement. And there is a list of companies that they work with to actually make new glass from the recycled glass. So I encourage you to get to know all of our sponsors and thank them for their, their uh, sponsorship of today's program and membership in the Illinois Recycling Foundation. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott DeFife who is the president of the Glass Packaging Institute. Thanks, Marta, um, and very good to be with you all uh, today. I have to remember that I am not controlling the slides, so I'll ask for uh, the slides to advance. Um, but uh, as a 
Just as an aside, I also want to mention that uh, both OI and Strategic Materials and another one of our presenters, uh, Ripple Glass, are, are members of the GPI. Uh, the Glass Packaging Institute is the trade association representing the glass container manufacturers in North America and our supply chain partners, both the inputs and the outputs, both so what we say, the, the hot side and the cold side of making the glass containers before they go into the furnace uh, in raw materials and come out and get packaged uh, and sent to our uh, customers uh, from the food and beverage manufacturing industry. And I say food and beverage manufacturing industry because largely over 90% of all glass containers in North America are for food or beverage packaging. There is a small percentage that's cosmetics and pharmaceutical, but largely food and beverage are the primary sources, primary end markets for glass packaging, and we can advance. Um, in addition to my role as the president of the Glass Packaging Institute, um, I also serve with another one of our presenters here, uh, Richard, um, on the Glass Recycling uh, Coalition, which is the glassrecycles.org. I wanted to put all the websites up here and tell you what the difference is between the organizations. The coalition is a broad set of industry groups all, not just container manufacturers, but everybody that's involved in glass recycling uh, that comes together for information and education. And the Glass Recycling Foundation, of which I am also now the president, um, is a, was spun up this past year uh, out, of the, out of the coalition as a 501c3 that is beginning to both take in revenue and grants from third parties and then turn them around uh, to make grants to communities largely communities uh, that want to expand or address their glass recycling uh, infrastructure. Uh, and the GRF uh, has uh, only been uh, really in existence for a little over a year. And during a COVID year, uh, we made our first grant awards uh, in December of 2020 and look forward to uh, dramatically expanding that in 2021. Um, for the participants of this webinar, I think the, the most um, critical thing I want to mention about the Glass Recycling Coalition is our new MRF certification program for glass. Um, we've got several MRFs that are certified gold, silver, bronze status for glass recycling using ISRI uh, developed standards, uh, you know, through um, a lot of technical uh, advisors. Uh, and it is free to submit your material, your cullet material for certification. And we encourage MRFs uh, to do that. Meeting the uh, glass GRC standards um, is a great indication of the marketability of the material that's coming out of your MRF. So we can move forward. Um, again, um, glass is one of the original core recyclables. It is one of the original core food and beverage containers. It's been around for centuries. Um, here, I, I include this just to show you the uh, expanse of the glass industry in the United States and why consumers continue to support glass. Um, 80 to 90% positive uh, ratings from consumers on glass. Um, many different segments uh, support glass and prefer glass as their container of choice. And glass recycling is a net impact positive on sustainability and environment. Um, for every six tons of recycled glass that um, are recy recirculated through the container industry, you're saving one ton of carbon emissions. And recycling glass creates 10 times as many jobs as landfill. We can move forward. And here's a, a, one of my favorite maps of the glass infrastructure in the United States. And I say uh, United States, but we also have included some of our Canadian uh, locations here. Um, I'm going to get a better map that includes some of my Mexico border uh, plants uh, going forward. But the, the main takeaway here is glass is a domestic industry. Glass manufacturing is a domestic industry. Glass recycling is a domestic industry. Glass was never sent to China as a part of National Sword or any, you know, isn't affected directly by National Sword. There are indirect implications of National Sword on the uh, recycling system that we can talk about today. But uh, there are over 45, 45 or so plus and a new plant in Georgia, container manufacturing plants in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and um, the glass that is, is largely a 
uh, circular economy and a regional uh, regional application. We can move forward. Uh, recently, uh, GPI member companies uh, uh, sponsored and spent about six months with a deep dive into how to improve glass recycling in the United States with a goal of creating a roadmap over the course of the next decade to get the average recycled content, not just the recovery rates for glass up to 50%, but the average recycled content rate for glass up to 50% in the next decade. Now, glass can be, a new container can be made with over 90% recycled content. I guess it's theoretically possible. Some of my uh, glass engineers might tell me, don't quite say completely 100% recycled content because there's always a little bit of variability, but uh, over, you know, all the companies report to me that they can make a bottle with, you know, nearly 95% recycled content. The problem is getting access to that material and also exactly what do you want your bottle to look like, uh, color, feel, things of that nature, uh, and the availability of the materials across different regions of the country. Uh, on average, the average recycled content of a glass bottle today in North America is around 33%. Um, and the recycling rate has hovered around the same amount, maybe a little bit of dip this past year, especially due to COVID. We can talk about those if you have questions about that. But we have a goal over the course of the next 10 years of getting the recovery rate for glass up to 50% and the recycled content rate up to 50%. Next. Um, and again, improving because of the sustainability, uh, the positive sustainability features of glass recycling, um, we're going to getting to that to that goal, that 50% recovery rate will be uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by over by nearly one one and a half uh, million metric tons annually, the equivalent of about taking 300,000 cars off the road each year. Next slide. All right, so what's possible, right? So we've talked about our goal, 50%, what's possible? And just as a benchmark, we know we're not Europe. Our rules are completely different. Our infrastructure is completely different. But just as a benchmark, today in Europe, uh, glass recycling rates average around 70%, recovery rates around 70%. Um, I believe that uh, based on conversations with my FEVE counterparts, FEVE is the European, my equivalent in Europe, um, they would tell me that their average recycled content rate for glass bottles in Europe is about 50% right now, uh, but the recovery rate is, is nearly 70% across Europe. Now, again, Europe uses a, a, an array of different deposit programs and bottle banks and things of that nature, very different infrastructure, but it's completely possible. And if you look at what we do here in the United States, the deposit container states, 10 deposit container states supply approximately 60% of the cullet that makes it back into glass container manufacturing. There are other uses for recycled glass, but the high quality material from container states is making it back into container plants across the country. And the recycling and recovery rate for glass in a container state is nearly triple that of non-deposit states. I've got another slide coming up that will show you why. <laughs> but before we get to that, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit um, on the Great Lakes region, the Illinois area. You can see there are many uh, glass facilities. Uh, there are manufacturing plants and um, processing plants in Illinois. I want to make sure I get RMC's plant in there now since they're processing glass colored as well. So I need to update this. But even in neighboring Wisconsin, Indiana, Missouri, Iowa's a bottle bill state, Michigan's a bottle bill state. I can guarantee you that there is glass from Michigan, probably from Iowa as well, making its way into manufacturing in Illinois. Those circles, let me, if we can just go back real quick, I just wanna show you those, those, those mileage circles. That's generally a 100 mile or 200 mile concentric circle around glass infrastructure in, in the state. So most of the, central and northern part of Illinois is covered readily within 100 to 200 miles uh, reach of uh, glass container manufacturing plants. A little bit of a gap in southern Illinois, um, but we can do um, other work to um, address those, those issues. Now we can go forward. Um, back to our study about how to get to our goal. 
Um, one of the things that we did is we zoomed in on a top 12, top 15 target market areas. I can, I can guarantee the folks on this webinar that Illinois is, is directly in our sites. Um, you're a top five uh, population state. You are uh, within reach of many glass um, parts of the glass industry. And unfortunately, there's a low uh, glass recovery rate right now in Illinois. These are our estimates based on data that we were able to derive based on sales of glass into the market and recovery rates. Um, as I said, nationwide, we're usually averaging about 33% um, recycled content. And in this past year, we're going to estimate the glass recovery rate nationwide was more at 27%, a little bit of slippage due to COVID and yield loss um, is factored in there. But um, again, if we can there's a lot of room to grow uh, and be very successful in Illinois. And that's why we wanna uh, work with the folks on this call uh, to improve glass recycling in the state. Next slide. Now we talked about one of the key differences between the bottle deposit states recovery rates and the non-deposit states recovery rates. And don't take this to mean that I am leading a, a parade for a bottle deposit bill in Illinois. It's an option, uh, but there are other issues related to it political issues, infrastructure issues, things, cost issues, things of that nature. But there's no doubt that there is a difference in the amount of glass that's recovered uh, in deposit states and non-deposit states. This is a, a material flow matrix for uh, non-deposit states where you can see on average 40 to 45% is going directly to landfill. And when you uh, include the amount that's going to curbside, but then gets pulled out for cover or um, other aggregates and things of that nature and goes directly to and goes to the landfill, even if it makes a pit stop through a MRF, um, nearly two thirds of the glass, we don't even really get to touch in the reprocessing market to get to end markets, such as packaging, um, fiberglass insulation, uh, mineral replacement or other durables. Next slide. <sighs> If you, if you remember one word and one word only from my presentation about glass uh, going forward, I'm gonna talk about quality. Quality matters in terms of yield, quality matters in terms of price, quality matters in terms of the distance that that glass will travel. Um, good quality glass has high value on the secondary markets. That material, I guarantee you right now, is traveling through the state of Illinois to bottle plants from Michigan and other bottle, bottle bill states uh, because high quality cullet uh, that gets to bottle plants can travel, especially on freight rail, you know, over a thousand miles. Um, and most uh, economics agree that good quality loads of glass can get 150 to 200, 250 miles uh, to end markets. Uh, and so most of the state is reachable. Uh, most of the state has a uh, reason to do it. And really anything from like Peoria North, uh, there's no transportation reason why the glass could not get recycled into a circular economy and back into glass container manufacturing. There are going to be quality reasons there's gonna be contamination issues that may uh, impact the price of that. Uh, but from a tr simple transportation logistics, um, most of the, about 70, 75% of the population of the state can be, uh, their glass can be uh, made it back into um, glass container markets uh, economically. Next slide. Um, alternative solutions. And so this is where it comes now. Uh, what is our status today? What is our goal in 10 years? What are the steps that we need to take to get there? Um, I mentioned Ripple. There's a, an early view of one of Ripple's uh, favorite, you know, better uh, looking uh, drop-off containers. Um, and up on top is a strategic materials uh, a picture from strategic materials about this is what glass collet looks like after processing. You'll notice all the different colors are there. And so I'm able to 
um, debunk some myths or answer some questions. There's a lot of misinformation about glass recycling. Color doesn't really matter once it gets to processing. Most modern processors can sort the colors with optical sorters and things of that nature. But we are going to be working very deliberately at almost every option that you see on this page. If we can uh, get a coalition of the willing or some partnerships to do some of this, aggregation, drop-offs, um, hub and spoke, MRF infrastructure, whatever it's going to take, it's it's going to take all of it together to get to our goals of 50%. Um, and we are, are working on bar and restaurant collection programs and things of that nature um, in the Chicago area as well right now. So um, if you're interested in working with us, please reach out. Um, as again, at the beginning of my presentation, I put my email and I'm sure that Marta and Gloria and all the folks at um, Illinois Restaurant uh, Recycling Association can get, can get you connected to me if you have any questions about working with uh, GPI going forward. I think that's it for my, yep, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. That was wonderful. And uh, for all, all of our attendees, we'll have a list of all attendees with email, so you will definitely get Scott's contact information. Uh, I want to introduce Brian Rhodes. He is, uh, he is one of our board members. Uh, he helped design our flyer that you noticed, possibly, and our advertising. And he is here to talk about area recycling in Pekin, Illinois, and their approach to glass. Thanks, Marta, and thanks, Scott. Um, what I'd like to do uh, is kind of take the baton from Scott and zoom in and kind of give a much more focused and, and localized view from a MRF operator's perspective of, you know, what glass means in, in our day-to-day -day, uh, life. So uh, next slide, please. Just a little bit of background about the company. Area Recycling, uh, we are a MRF located in Tazewell County, Pekin, Illinois. We're right along the Illinois River. Um, we provide recycling services to residential, commercial, and industrial accounts throughout the Midwest. Uh, primarily, our, uh, our accounts come from Peoria, Mason, Tazewell, Woodford counties, um, if that means anything to those familiar with Central Illinois. Um, we typically receive most of our uh, residential material from PDC and area companies on our solid waste side of the business, but we also um, have many third-party haulers who bring material to ARI. Uh, we, we do offer roll-off service, we have a box truck, and we do daily semi-truck routes uh, where we deliver baled material directly to uh, mills on a daily basis. And uh, as of last month, December 2020, we celebrated our fifth anniversary. So we are kind of the new kids on the block in the recycling game, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. Um, we purchased area recycling from Midland Davis in December of 2015. And at that time, the, the facility was only running part-time and processing about 500 tons a month. And I, I believe that the city of Pekin may have been their only municipal contract at that time. Um, and in April of 19, we shut the facility down for 60 days to allow a, a comprehensive upgrade of the facility and the equipment. And on June 1st, we kind of reemerged with a grand reopening of an entirely new sort line. And um, as of December 2020, the retooled facility processes um, actually closer to 1,500 tons of inbound single stream material a month, and we ship outbound 2,000 tons per month of baled commodities. Next slide, please. Uh, just quickly, the upgrade consisted primarily of uh, a ground up uh, installation of a three and a half million dollar new sorting line of um, machine X equipment. Uh, we added an 8,000 square foot addition to the facility itself, which consisted of what is now the, the new tipping floor. We added five new dock spaces and a baler. And uh, coincidentally, we are installing another new baler next month. So we'll be down for just a couple of days to facilitate that. And uh, we did install a fire rover system for safety. Next slide. Um, 
as it pertains to glass specifically, and this is where I will kind of dovetail into some of what Scott um, presented. There are two different types of glass that we deal with um, as a result of the processes in our system. The first is what we call system glass or single stream glass. Some people call it MRF glass, but the photos that he uh, that Scott presented in his quality slide look very similar, as you'll note, to those on this particular slide. And this is what um, the result of glass that comes to ARI specifically um, through curbside programs. And you know, when you take your beer and wine bottles and your pickle jars out to the curb and drop them in the toter, they go into a packer truck. They're transported from wherever you may live to peak in Illinois, um, dumped on the tip floor. And when they run through our sorting system, um, by the time they come out the other end, it is glass is kind of reduced to uh, crushed collet that is less than two inches in diameter. And at that point, it becomes a mixture of fines with other materials on, of the same size, primarily paper, bottle caps, um, tin can lids, things like that. So um, it is technically 45% glass in this material by weight, but it is highly contaminated, which um, only goes to reinforce Scott's um, perception of um, how important quality is in the process. So this material, by the time we handle it, haul it, and pay for processing or um, uh, putting it in a landfill regardless, this material nets about a $75 a ton cost to us at the end of the day. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we have tried to do um, to address this problem and, and make it not only more uh, sustainable solution, but also one that's more cost effective for for us and our municipal and commercial customers is we've tried to um, get glass out of the single stream model and into these walk-up containers, which we've, we've uh, configured a number of these. And it, you can see from the picture there that there are sliding doors on the container itself, but those are bolted shut and there are about eight inch diameter holes in them that'll accommodate even the largest like wine or liquor bottle, but it won't accommodate a television or a swimming pool or a lot of the other stuff that ends up in citywide uh, drop-off programs. So um, as a result, the glass that we are able to get from these walk-up containers has been extremely clean. And due to that, it has enabled us to sell it for a, a better rate to, uh, it is more marketable on the, on the open market. And as you can see, our net cost on this material is about $25 a ton, which is a 66% savings over the cost of the single stream glass. And it's a lot more marketable. So um, our push specifically has been to try and get as much glass as possible out of the single stream model and into these uh, walk-up containers, which is consistent with you know, uh, what Ripple Glass and some of the others that you'll hear from later are, are trying to do as well. And, and just to kind of, um, as I was putting this presentation together, it prompted me to do a bit of a deep dive. Um, and if we look at a couple examples specifically, the city of Peoria is about 133,000 people according to the latest census. And they do have glass in their municipal contract. It was part of um, it was it was one of the items that was non-negotiable. If you want to if you want to bid on it, you got to take glass. So we do. They're allowed to um, put glass in their toters in the city of Peoria. The city of Pekin, however, we have successfully negotiated the removal of glass from the city contract, but we have replaced it uh, with a glass only walk up container like this. Uh, and in the city of Washington, Illinois, uh, there are about sixteen thousand. Uh, residents, same thing. We've we've successfully removed glass from the, the city uh, Twitter program and instituted a glass walk-up. 
And what we have noticed is that by volume, the participation is um, comes out relatively equally. So we we feared maybe that uh, since it's not quite as easy to go to a drop off site remotely as it is to walk to your own curb, um, but that we would suffer in the participation. But what we're finding is actually that's not been the case. The volume of the walk-up programs has been consistent with the volume in the, um, the curbside program. So that's very encouraging. And that's something that we hope to kind of um, increase the participation and, and um, make these programs more accessible to uh, more of our municipal customers. So that's kind of our perspective on it. And I appreciate everybody's time. Thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm Josh Boyer. I'm the regional manager for Ripple Glass. Um, going off of a lot what Brian and Scott were talking about, um, I had to adjust some of my, um, I apologize, I have my fancy ring uh, monitor on my door. I don't know if you guys were able to hear that. But anyways, um, going off of that, the quality of glass is extremely crucial. Um, I had to remove that from the presentation to save a little bit of time, but I had pictures um, similar to Scott's and Brian's um, differences between a lot of recycling centers glass and um, what clean glass looks like. And Brian has already been able to see the changes in value of glass with that. That being said, I'll get started. Um, so next slide, please. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. Okay, I'm gonna give a little example here for um, the city of Quincy, Illinois, who I'll actually be meeting with um, later this evening to start a glass program as well, but they have a population of about 40,000 um, residents. And on average, they could recycle about 260 tons of glass a year. Um, and that's only 20%. So the numbers we kind of pull together is a 20% rule and that's really good. So if we were talking about what Scott was saying earlier of 50%, that number would be even higher. But uh, for instance, if you see here a population of 100,000, that's 650 tons of glass recycled in one year. And um, that's again, 20%, only 20% of the residents doing this. And the point of all this is how much money a recycling center can save, a municipality can save um, through those landfill tipping fee avoidance. Um, I'll even give an example. The city of Topeka, Kansas was doing this. Um, they were throwing away all of their glass and they were spending well over $5,000 a month just in landfill tipping fees for glass alone. Once they had that removed, that is something that they could put directly back into their budget. So um, very significant for a city or a recycling center. Um, anyways, moving on. Next slide, please. Here's some examples of why recycling glass is beneficial and everybody was kind of going through this, so I don't want to take too much time, but yes, it saves raw materials. Um, one ton of glass equals one ton of uh, natural resources conserved. So actually a little point I want to make on that is that a, one bottle of glass can be recycled into one bottle of glass. You know, there's some products and commodities that will have waste no matter what when it gets recycled. But for glass, 100% of it can get reused. And I think that's pretty impressive to note is that one bottle can be recycled for another whole bottle. There is no waste in between the two. Um, it lessens the demand for energy. It cuts carbon emissions. There's no processing byproducts and it creates jobs. So uh, lots of positives for recycling glass. Next slide, please. All right. Um, and so the convenience versus recovery, this is um, kind of a touchy subject for some areas because some will do it better than others. But in a grand scheme of things across the country, about 40% of glass in commingled recycling goes to the landfill and 20% is downcycled. And what that means is aggregates or abrasive, so like daily alternate cover or um, layering down for construction projects on a highway. 
So that really leaves for general single stream commingled glass about 40% total glass is being recycled. Um, and that's obviously below 50%. So quite a bit of this is being either downcycled or just going straight to the landfill. Now, even separating, which is a much better step, and that's, as you can see here, paper and cardboard collected separately from plastics, metals, and glass, um, which is the dual stream. About 10% is landfill, so not nearly as bad, but could use improvement, and 90% recycled. And then if you do source separating, like Ripple Glasses program, where we have it completely separated out of the stream, we have it in about 98% recycled. And this is actually dated from about 2018. And I will tell you, we've updated that a little bit. And we're much closer. We're about the 99%. And we're hopefully by 2022 being a zero waste. So that'd be pretty amazing. But it's a big step up from being having about 60% of the glass being in the landfill. All right, and this is a big chart, I know, so we're gonna focus on a couple small things here. And as you can see in my boxes, it shows the single stream carts bi-weekly. It's the second row down. And if you look over, that's about 42% of the glass being recovered, which I just uh, explained to you guys. But if you look at the actual glass recovered, on average, it's about 80 tons, as you can see here on the far right. So for single stream, on average, about 80 tons being recovered. Now, if you look at drop-off, 92% is being recovered on average across um, all source separating glass recycling. That actually puts the actual tonnage being recycled at 96 tons. And the point I want to make here is some people will say, well, you can just throw everything into your single stream. And more, since more people are willing to do it and more glass is going in there, more will get recycled at the end of the day instead of just having to take it to your drop off site. Well, in fact, since there's so much contamination that you deal with that Brian was talking about, and Scott was talking about, actually more glass is being recycled at drop off locations instead of the single stream. So just because more glass is getting tossed in the single stream does not mean more of it is being recovered. Um, and that's a important note to make in a source separating program. And next slide, please. So here's a little uh, poster and flyer we put out for what's accepted and what's not accepted. And this will benefit basically any recycling community uh, or recycling center, I mean. Um, and what's accepted is the normal shatterable glass. That's the easiest way to put it, is what can break. That's your containers. That's your normal drinking vessels, uh, candle jars, and even tempered glass. We can take tempered glass, which is like your shower doors and most windows. Now, what we can't take is a lot of porcelain, ceramic. Um, I know you think you can tell the difference sometimes, but people will throw a mug down and since it shatters, they might think that it's glass and it's technically not glass. So those aren't, accept or aren't acceptable. And then same with laminated glass. Now, the best representation for laminated glass are windshields. Those indestructible glasses cannot be recycled. Same with TVs and light bulbs. Those have wiring in there. And I know it gets a little complicated, but the point I want to make is the pure 100% glass, like beer bottles and uh, any sort of alcoholic beverage bottles and just clear glass that can shatter is recyclable. All that other in-between kind of stuff is not. And of course, as Brian was putting it, cardboard boxes and bags, we don't want those because that can cause issues in a processing plant. And so we want that loose load of just glass being tossed into these containers. I know it's different in your totes because people want to put everything in a bag and throw it in there, but we actually want it loosely loaded in there because it's just going to go directly into processing. There is no ripping bags open or separating or throwing it into the landfill. It's going directly into processing. Uh, next slide, please. Now here's a little idea of what we do. So with those drop-off sites and um, those drop-off boxes, much like Brian has as well, what we do is you pick it up um, once it's filled up and usually residents will give a call and say, hey, this is filling up and there'll be numbers on the side of the box. The local hauler will bring it back to the bunker. And as you can see here, these are some pictures of the bunkers that we have. And you simply open it up and let it pour out into the back and it is loosely loaded. I compare it to, you know, like your local tractor supply where you put the gravel or the mulch. Um, that's basically how you put glass and you store 
um, about 25 tons is kind of the key number here. And that's what's able to justify a haul for us because glass is really heavy and it costs a lot to move it around. Because if you think about the difference between hauling cardboard and glasses, glass is weighing a lot more than the cardboard and you can fit much more on. So the haulers charge quite a bit more. And uh, the key here is, is getting enough glass in that load to justify this haul. So 25 tons is very important. And that's why these bunkers are great to store glass. It can get enough in there. And if you go to the next slide here, you can see that most communities and recycling centers will use a open or a, we have an open top end dump trailer and they will use a front end loader to just scoop it directly from the bunker and pour it into these open top trailers and all we do is just send it over your way you scoop and load it and that that's it and then we bring it back to our plant for processing um, so as simple as that the key here is just having those bunkers and as you can see here i'll just make one more example um, this picture on the middle right here that's actually a forklift with an IBC tote, I think this picture is actually a Gaylord box, but we actually have some companies that will just load into Gaylord boxes and they'll have a rotator attachment on their forklift where it lifts up and then when it's time to pour, they can rotate the forklift over and it's, as you can see here, just pours directly in the back of the truck. Now you need about 40 or 50 of those to make a 25 ton haul, um, but that's just another option, let's say, if bunker isn't an option for you all. And moving on to the next one. So what happens with our glass? We turn it into fiberglass insulation and also bottles again. And um, we work with Owens Corning, uh, the one in Kansas City, and uh, they make you know the pink insulation that goes in your walls that creates energy efficient homes. So that's pretty uh, amazing. I actually, uh, I always say that some of the beer you're drinking might end up in your wall one day. And um, I actually had, it was funny, I had a, radio station interview and a guy told me um i gave him that little line of the insulation you know beer you're drinking might end up in your wall one day and he said well my beer ends up in my wall but i don't think it's the same way you guys do it uh and so i said hey i don't care how you party man as long as you recycle it afterwards but anyways this is uh the two outlets we have for our glass it's either turning into bottles down in uh, oklahoma i didn't even mention that our dog down in oklahoma they create the boulevard bottles actually that uh, is located in kansas city i don't know how familiar you all are with kansas city but boulevard's a big brewery here and so they make the bottles there and then the insulation and those are the two end uses we have for the glass and then next slide please and that's it oh i don't know if you can see my contact information below but um that's just a picture of one of our bins we saw earlier if you want to reach out to me i can actually um, I could probably put in the chat box my contact information if you can't see it here, but um, please reach out if you have a community that's interested in getting glass recycling. We'd love to talk and try to work something out with you all, and I appreciate your time. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. I'm going to transition now to John Tiglar, who's also a member of our board and our events committee and helps us with our online issues. So with no further ado, John, you wanna take it away for resource management company? John having technical difficulties? You're muted, John. There we go, thank you. Thanks, Marta. Uh, I'm John Tigelar, I'm with resource management companies. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Marta. Okay, so first a little bit about uh, RMC, Resource Management Companies owns and operates a material recovery facility in Chicago Ridge, which procures, receives, processes, and ships a variety of secondary commodities originating from curbside collection and commercial and industrial sources in the Midwestern United States. Uh, we also provide logistics and transloading services through our wholly owned RMC Logistics Unit and we are active in the procurement and sale of secondary fiber through our Los Angeles-based RMC International subsidiary. Go to the next slide. Okay, with regards to glass, uh, RMC has been handling glass in one way or another for approximately 30 years. Uh, we've been in business since 1991. 
In the past, we've re relied on third party processors. Uh, we'd remove the glass from our incoming stream and ship it to glass processors in the area. But in 2006, we began the process of beneficiating glass. Uh, it was a long road, but we now create color separated flint and amber glass for sale to bottle makers, as well as crushing green and off color glass, along with pieces that are too small to optically sort to uh, fiberglass insulation manufacturers. You can see a picture of our flint pile there. Uh, slide, please. All right, the steps that we take to sort and clean the glass. Uh, the first step uh, to removing the glass from our incoming stream of material is to classify it by size. We found that about 15 to 20% of our incoming single stream by weight is mixed broken glass uh, and also what goes along with it. Uh, things like organics, bottle caps, shredded paper, dirt. Uh, we have screens throughout our facility in order to get this material out. We also have to incorporate drying into our process, especially in the winter or after there's been a lot of rain, it becomes more difficult to get a clean product without first drying it. Uh, there are also vacuums throughout our entire glass processing operation. Uh, we need vacuums to get all the little bits of paper out of the stream. Uh, and that also goes back to the drying. You can imagine how much easier it is to remove paper from the glass when it's dry versus when it's wet. We also have magnets at various points in our system to aid in the removal of ferrous metals, uh, things like bottle caps, et cetera. And finally, we have our optical sorting lines, which you can see in the image on this slide. These optical sorters are used to sort out flint and amber glass, as well as remove any remaining non-glass material that's in our stream. Slide. So what are some of the challenges in the handling of glass? Uh, first, it's capital intensive. We have several optical sorters, uh, two grinders, and that's not to mention all the conveyors, vacuums, cyclones, trommels, screens, dryers, uh, bag houses for dust removal, et cetera. Um, second challenge is that glass is abrasive. It will try to destroy almost anything it touches. And this of course leads to high maintenance costs for us. Third, it's technically challenging. Uh, the specs required by our end users are very demanding. Uh, just as an example, we need to get our crushed glass to a point where it contains less than a fifth of a percent of organics before it can be shipped to the fiberglass manufacturers that we sell to. It took us a lot of time and energy and money to get to the point where we can achieve that result on a consistent basis. And lastly, it's energy intensive. Each of our optical sorters are capable of uh, doing 1,000 ejections per second, and that requires a lot of uh, energy and compressed air. Slide. So in my opinion, should glass be removed from the curbside collection programs? I would say no. Um, from what we are told by companies that we sell our glass to, there is market capacity to absorb all the volume that is out there. Um, and Josh also had a similar statistic that for every 10% of cullet that replaces the same amount of virgin material, the fiberglass manufacturers save an average of 3% in energy costs. And there are also reduced carbon emissions when making bottle, cullet, bottle from cullet versus virgin material, which Josh and uh, Scott pointed out. So ideally, yes, taking in glass separate from the other material we handle would make processing it easier. Uh, but you could say that about anything we take in. Uh, single stream in general has been a significant challenge for MRFs for a long time. Um, but at this point, I don't think there's any going back. It's going to be tough to convince people to start separating their recyclable material again. I think it's going to be very challenging to ask residents to bring their glass to drop offs when they've been including it in their bins for years. Um, I know Brian says they're seeing uh, quite a bit of success with that, and that's encouraging. Um, but we can't even get residents to not throw garbage in their bins. So how are we gonna get, convince them to exclude glass? Um, like I said, I know that Brian and Josh have been having success in obtaining clean glass in this way. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, but in my opinion, there will always be glass in the single stream. Uh, even if you remove it from curbside programs, education is so hard. Uh, I think that um, there'll be a, a significant amount of people that will continue to just throw their glass in, into their recycle bin. Um, and because of the benefits of recycling glass, I think it's important that we find a way as MRFs to deal with it. So thank you.
Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, great to be uh, talking with all of you today. Uh, my name is Richard Hoke. Um, I work for a company called Diageo. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of Diageo, um, but they do know our brands. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll give you a little bit of background about who Diageo is. So um, our company was founded, I think, in 1987 by the, the uh, formation of uh, Guinness uh, beer that you're probably familiar with and another company you're probably not called Grand Metropolitan, uh, which was a spirits company um, in the UK. Those two companies came together and formed uh, what is now called Diageo. And after that, um, they went on a, a gigantic um, growth uh, curve that ended up with um, you know, over 200 brands. Um, I would love to sit here and talk to you about each one of them and uh, give you my brand passion. Uh, but this is just a partial um, you know, uh, sampling here of some of our brands that you might be familiar with. And um, what I, I'll, I'll bring it up again at the end, but what a slide I don't have is on here is that I work in our uh, brand technical center um, in Plainfield, Illinois, um, which is pro probably many of you know what that is, but it's just on the uh, southwest um, uh, side of the greater Chicagoland region. And the Brand Technical Center, it represents Diageo's, um, depends on the year, if we are the first or second largest bottling site um, in Diageo globally. Uh, we kind of run neck and neck with another uh, similar site over in um, the UK. Um, but where I work, we bottle, just to give you an example, we bottle all the Smirnoff pretty much um, that's sold in the United States and pretty much all the Captain Morgan and pretty much all the Smirnoff ice uh, right here uh, in good old uh, Plainfield, Illinois. Um, and if you ever drive down 143rd Street, uh, you'll see the building, uh, but you won't see any of these brands out, out front. Um, most most uh, alcohol companies, um, you know, lay pretty low and that's uh, because, you know, distilled spirits, uh, it's a lot of alcohol and uh, it's not something that, you know, that, I mean, it is a flammable product. So um, it's a high secure site. And, um, but, you know, someday maybe uh, I can host some of you um, at our site. So uh, next slide. So um, just a little background about, you know, why Diageo cares, uh, you know, our ambition um, and they, they really drive this through our company uh, ever since I've been with the company now for over seven years um, is to become one of the world's most trusted and respected um, consumer product companies in the world. And um, as you might surmise, um, part of that is, um, you know, we have a very uh, ambitious uh, sustainability platform. So next slide. Um, the, in 2010, uh, the company set a bunch of uh, sustainability targets uh, for 2020, uh, which uh, you know just passed. And um, I'm not going to go into all these, um, but you know there are different areas. Um, you know these are more of the what you would think of as your common sustainability targets. We also have um, targets around you know, human capital and um, responsible drinking and those types of things as well. Uh, but I thought this would be a better, you know, more um, relevant to this group here. I think what you um, are, care about most is in the lower right-hand corner here. Uh, we set out to reduce our total packaging weight uh, by 15% and to increase our recycled content overall in our packaging um, by 45% or to 45% and to make sure that 100% of our package packaging can be recycled. And um, I think in the last slide, I kind of give you our, where we landed on those. Um, but I, what I can tell you is that we, uh, the first two there, uh, we just made it and actually you'll see it a little bit. And for the having 100% of our packaging recycled or um, being able to be recycled, um, we were really, really close. So uh, next slide. Um, just to give you a little bit more flavor uh, about, you know, um, how, you know, serious we are around sustainability. Uh, this top uh, four groups here are some of the um, um, 
organizations that have recognized us um, for our sustainability efforts. And um, in the bottom section there, those are some of the working groups um, that we belong to uh, in North America with regards to sustainability. Um, Scott mentioned at the beginning um, that Diageo is one of the uh, members of the Glass Recycling Coalition. Um, and actually, we're one of the founding companies of it. Uh, I, I want to say um, I wasn't involved in it at that time. It was the uh, GRC was started in 2016, but it was a Diageo employee that actually conceived the idea and got the first group of people together at our site in uh, our North American headquarters in, um, at the time, Norwalk, Connecticut, and uh, got about, I think, 20 or 30 different companies together to talk about forming this coalition. And uh, here we are today, uh, 2021, and uh, it's, it's a viable um, you know, uh, coalition uh, representing the entire value chain um, of the uh, glass recycling industry. And I would urge anyone uh, that's here to please look, check us out and consider joining us. Um, we just restructured our tiers um, to allow for uh, even broader membership and uh, you know, at, at a really modest cost, I think. Um, so if you're interested at all, uh, we would love to have you uh, join our coalition. All right, so next slide. So um, I put this together. These are some snapshots um, from uh, our 2019 annual report, uh, just to show you, as I mentioned earlier, um, so we did hit our recycled content goal. This, and now this is globally. Um, we, our target was uh, 5 point or 45% and we were at 45.8 um, across all of our packaging. And um, we're right now in the process of, um, you know, getting our 2025 20, goals and 2030 goals put together uh, and announced to the public. Some of that's already out there. But just to give you an idea, of why glass is so important to Diageo. If you look at the right there, in 2019, our total packaging materials we used as a company across the globe was 1.5 million tons of packaging. Well, if you look at that top number there, at that time, 83% of our packaging by weight was glass. Well, you know, you can do the math. <laughs> um, the, if if eighty three percent of our packaging by uh, weight was glass, and you have a, a goal of forty five percent, you can uh, figure it out. And I was really pleased to see uh, the GPI's goal of fifty percent because you know it's it's just around that a little bit higher actually if you figure it out. And that's assuming though that everything else is one hundred percent recycled content, which it's not, um, but some of it is. Some of our other, you know, uh, commodities um, are 100% recycled content today, and some of them are getting close. So um, that is why uh, glass is so important to us as a company. Um, we aren't going to make our goals if we don't have recycled content. And as uh, Scott also mentioned at the beginning, he saw the difference between the United States and Europe. And as you might guess, uh, being you know, the largest or second largest bottling site in the, com in the company globally, um, you know, we are under a, a very, uh, you know, we're under a lens of the company uh, to get recycling rates up um, and in our bottles um, here in the United States, um, because you know, the, everyone knows uh, where the numbers are with respect to you know, recycling uh, content. Um, I guess from my perspective, um, you know, I, I, what I will say, listen to everyone, um, it's great to hear all the dialogue. One thing I will point out, um, I am a scientist by training um, and there, it's, actually, it's actually better than one-to-one -one because when the glass makers, and I'm not a glass scientist, so I, I speak this from what I've been told, uh, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. Um, when the glass, makers make glass out of raw materials, there's a loss in the melting process. When they make it out of a bottle that's already been made, that loss is gone because there's already been the reduction. So actually for every pound of recycled glass they use, they displace like 1.1 pounds of uh, 
you know, raw materials. So, you know, it's, I think there's just lots of good reasons why, um, you know, it, it makes sense to recycle glass, uh, you know, the energy reduction, the carbon footprint uh, and the energy. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, panel and this group. And, uh, you know, I look forward to, you know, um, further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thanks, Josh, too. I didn't get to say thanks to him. So I want to thank everybody who actually has just uh, has just presented for us and put together this information. Uh, I do have a couple of prepared questions. Um, and the first one, and uh, also I believe John is going to be putting together some questions that came in on our chat while we were doing these. Um, so besides the question of when do we get to go party in Plainfield, <laughs> how clean does glass need to be for a MRF to take it? We've touched about this quality, you know, so from the, from the curbside, from the perspective of the resident or the business who's trying to send the glass to the MRF, how clean does the glass have to be to be accepted by the MRF so that they know they could actually market that glass? Marta, D, this is Scott. You, I can I can start with uh, you know an overall general recommendation. Of course, each community may have slightly different you know requirements, but a gen, a gentle rinse is recommended. Uh, but a, a thorough clean. It's not like you have to run it through the dishwasher or clean it before you get it recycled. Gentle rinse helps. The fact that seventy percent of the glass is beverage, it usually it comes out relatively easily. Uh, maybe if you've got some peanut butter, you want to work a little extra hard on it, but um, it generally um, doesn't require washing before you recycle. I would say that the cleaner, the better, obviously, but I understand that not everyone's going to be washing their bottles. Um, so yeah, and uh, a rinse would definitely help. Brian, did you want to add anything to that? I think uh, for me, I just kind of work with with uh, the people that I'm selling it to and take my direction from them. But at the end of the day, we're kind of at the mercy of what we receive and we do our best with what we get. And then we try and tailor, you know, future educational programs and things like that to help um, to help nudge things in the right direction uh, on an ongoing basis through our social media and and things like that is how we hope to achieve results. Josh, at your drop off. So. Uh, same answer. Um, obviously, the cleaner the better, but it's much different recycling glass that's a little dirty compared to like a pizza box. You know, if a greasy pizza box gets tossed in recycling, it's going to have to go right to the landfill. But if a salsa jar still has a little bit of residue left in it, that's absolutely fine. As long as there's no other commodities in there, you know, if it's not just paper and metal and wood mixed in that's a different story but if it has a little bit of organics in it it's fine thank you i appreciate that oh so what is the process that's used to convert the glass from the initial MRF sort into the glass that can be used by the manufacturer and i know that that was talked about by john with resource management how he's cleaning the glass is that fairly typical does that pretty much answer that question yeah, I mean, John's answer was yes. I mean, very, every bottle manufacturer, at least, I'll speak for the container manufacturers. I know a little bit about the insulation, fiberglass insulation as well. You know, the furnaces are the heart and soul of those machines. And you can't, you have to make sure that, you know, uh, material that does not belong in the furnace does not get in the furnace. And so it's really cleaning it to a spec so that you don't have ceramics and metals things of that nature um, due to the, you know, that will really hurt a furnace and, and mess up the plant. Uh, so there is secondary processing that happens for virtually everything that makes it back to a bottle plant uh, if it's been through the consumer um, setting. Exactly which steps, which MRFs or which processors take really depends on, as Brian has said, as, uh, as Josh has said, as, uh, as John has said, um, you know, how contaminated is that load, um, you know, before it gets to them. 
And then my other question that I had was why restaurants and bars face difficulties getting their recycling, their glass specifically recycled. They seem to be okay with cardboard, but um, that's, that's been something I've encountered my entire career. So that's 20, 30 years. <laughs> uh, if I'll, I'll start from our perspective. Uh, most communities do not have um, similar commercial recycling requirements to their residential requiring requirements. So there is uh, less, like for instance, where I live, even in Virginia, the commercial recycling is merely a volume-based requirement, not even a material-based requirement. So some equalizing of the requirements on commercial uh, entities would probably increase that. And there is a lot of good glass uh, from bars and restaurants that is going directly to landfill because of the, the system that it's being collected in. Brian, do you, you directly service some commercial entities. Could you fill that in as well? Uh, I think it, it, it all just comes down to working backwards from the value of the material and, and backing out the logistics and handling costs. Um, when we're talking about cardboard, um, right now it's $75 a ton, and, and you've got a little room there before it starts getting into the bone. But with glass, at least in the in the in the middle of central Illinois here, um, I don't have a lot of room to start with before it becomes an additional cost for the the commercial customer. And at that point, um, sometimes they will uh, using using the landfill cost as kind of the bar. Many commercial customers are willing to pay a small premium for sustainable. Uh, initiatives and things like that, but when you're talking about maybe twice the cost, of what it would be to put it in a landfill, that's when the conversation starts to get very difficult um, from our perspective. Is, is there, I guess, just to, to finish it off, is there a requirement that the bars sort the glass separately from the other recyclables to prevent the commingling because they do have so much glass? Is there a requirement for them to sort their glass by color? Does that, that come into play? Any, any of you familiar with that? Most communities don't have a requirement um, for bars and restaurants to sort glass. There are some who've imposed it and they've produced good glass streams. Um, largely, we would never recommend um, from a, a, a single stream type system, um, even a dual stream type system that, that consumers take the time to sort color. Um, you know, most modern facilities can sort the color with optical sorting. I would also like to point out um, from my experience with creating a commercial program in Kansas City for glass recycling, a lot of bar and restaurant owners, um, it, it is difficult for them to get something started. I just noticed that Matt mentioned this in the chat as well, but a lot of them like to keep the same system that they've had for years on end. And if it's just tossing it in the landfill and training servers, we've actually seen that, that they don't want to change anything. If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality. Um, and that's sometimes why it's difficult to get commercial programs started for recycling. Thank you. That's good. I, I think that the broken um, glass being mixed with plastic and paper still being marketable, it, the only point to that question was to show that if glass is broken in, in the curbside program, uh, it's still okay, it could still be processed by a, by a single stream MRF. So I just wanted to find out if you guys could verify that. Some people are afraid to break their glass or not put it in if it breaks. Yeah, I'll be the first to get this started that that is definitely a major myth um, that we hear all the time. And in fact, we want the opposite. We would prefer the glass to be broken. And what I was talking about during my presentation was that volume is crucial for us to haul it back to our plant. So if you have a full wine bottle versus a crushed wine bottle, you can fit a lot less in a truckload than you can if it's crushed down. So um, we would actually prefer people to be a little rough with it. I'll even give a little brief example. Um, we were having lighter loads from one of our communities we work with, and 
I don't know if this is legally okay, but in the back, they would actually, as their break to blow off steam, start chucking the bottles against their bunker walls and shatter them. And he said, the boys love it out at the yard. Um, and sure enough, I'm not even kidding. They had bigger loads afterwards because some of that glass was broken down. So we would like the opposite of keeping that glass put together and nice and clean. We would prefer it shattered. I can add that even if you put a, a bottle intact into your curbside bin, uh, on its way to the facility, the MRF, and throughout the MRF process, it will be broken at some point. So it doesn't really matter to us either way. Thank you. Does glass cause any risks in a landfill? Um, no, uh, glass is inert. It's uh, clean. It's safe. Uh, it's one of the best materials for food and beverage packaging for, for all of those reasons. So it doesn't have any impact in the landfill other than the, the lost opportunity of uh, recovering a completely sustainable and recyclable material. Yeah, I'd like to add in that glass never breaks down. That's another point is that glass is going to be the same piece of glass as it is a thousand years from now. So having that in the landfill, there is no breaking down or decomposing of it. So I've heard glass is a break-even material, meaning it costs as much to sort it as it brings in when you're selling it. So since other commodities shift up and down on the spectrum, why isn't every MRF accepting glass? There are um, short and long-term cost you know, horizons that people look at. Um, and I'll go back to my quality discussion. You know, the value of the material is highly dependent upon the volume and the quality of the material. Um, I guess what, you know, in our view, um, single stream can work, dual stream provides a lot of benefit. And, you know, Josh went through this with his uh, recommendations. It really depends. You have to tailor each community's program to the facilities that the material is eventually going to go through. Um, and you want to make sure that your input matches your processing and output um, really for the for the best the best scenario. How, how does shipping the glass to markets differ from shipping other commodities? I know we were looking at your circle, Scott. So I mean, obviously, glass is heavier than than some of the other materials. Um, and so it tends to be more localized in a regional uh, area. I can tell you that, um, you know, clean, good quality glass will travel. Um, and it's really depending upon, are you talking about the raw material getting to the MRF, the MRF material getting to a processor or the processed material getting to a, a, an end market plant, you know, different um, uh, means. Um, freight rail is a good friend for glass, it works well. Um, you know, um, you know. One thing I'll make sure that the folks in Illinois understand is there is bottle bill glass from Michigan traveling through your state to end markets beyond Illinois. <laughs> so um, there is a lot of. If you think of glass as a raw material that can has value and gets to end markets, um, you could think of it as a commodity that you could. Um, work on to produce and it creates jobs. Uh, but that material from the bottle bill states, Iowa, Michigan, serves a lot of glass plants in the Midwest. So the cleaner the glass, the further it can travel, it sounds like. Yep. Well, you know, along those lines, uh, this, is, this is what, I'll, you know, when every time uh, Scott says that it saddens me, because <laughs> um, if you look at that map that Scott showed at the beginning with the circles, and you know where I'm located, right here in the uh, north um, east region of the state. And you look at all the population within that 150 to 300 mile uh, radius of my. I mean, we, you know the glass suppliers uh, that you know provide us with glass in this region. Um, you know they they're sitting on a big pile of raw materials, I realize that sand is very plentiful in this part of the country, but they're also sitting on a huge pile of glass that's already made. And it, it you know, it, it's right here. So it, it's, um, it seems like it's 
the opportunity is ripe. And I'm just one, I'm just one end user, you know, in the, in the greater Chicagoland region. There's a lot of food as well. You know, pickles are still in glass. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, they haven't figured that one out yet. There's a lot of wine is still mostly in glass. Go down the aisle. I know people talk about the other commodities uh, that are used in packaging, but what do you see in a wine aisle? <laughs> it's yes. mostly glass. Um, and, uh, you know, people talk about it, um, you know, like why is, why is glass still so prevalent? And uh, our marketers and stuff, you know, they, they mention this all the time, but there's just something about distilled spirits. Uh, if you're going to spend 20 to $50 on a bottle of liquor that, that people want to, they want that solid feel, you know, of a glass bottle when they set it down. Um, it's just not the same if it's made out of anything else. So. <laughs> I've always heard it tastes better out of glass. When they introduce new beverages, they introduce them in glass. Uh, the last question that I had was what is an average price point or distance to a recycling facility when recycled glass becomes economically viable to transport? And it sounds like this is kind of along those lines of it depends how clean it is. But if anybody wanted to add any more to that, and then we're going to have uh, John Lardner from our board uh, give some questions that may have come in on the chat while we were all presenting here. Yeah, the only other thing I want to add to, to, to that, Marta, is that to, to refresh what I, what I think Josh uh, mentioned it is that landfill cost avoidance, especially for bars and restaurants. I mean, they're paying for the disposal. You're paying by weight. Um, many of the landfill companies want that glass in their landfill because they get paid by weight. Um, and uh, so it can be economically advantageous to, to move that glass out of the, the waste stream if you can, you know, get a good uh, uh, glass recycling program going. Going off what Scott said, it, that's exactly what I was thinking. A, a lot of people don't want to peel back the layers of how um, economically feasible it is recycling glass and they want to think of just a money making aspect but if you really think of a money saving aspect because people don't realize how much they are spending on those landfill tipping fees and what they end up having in their overall cost getting rid of the glass and if they can pull that back saving money is making money john did you have any questions from the chat john lardner this time yeah, I think there are maybe three questions. We've got a little bit of time left here. Uh, one uh, question came up is how um, have you found the cleanliness in your containers uh, for those that are spotting them out there? And have you seen much illegal dumping of those? Yeah, and I, uh, I think I briefly answered that, but I'm glad you mentioned it. I usually do this in my normal presentation. Um, why we created this purple brand uh, has been very important towards our contamination. And uh, it's now been being implemented out in Virginia as well. And Scott can attest to this, but we created this ripple branding that has, I mean, if you look up any of our roll off bins, it says recycle your glass here and glass only no bags. And we'll even have some fun little slogans on it, like check out our nice glass and people get a big kick out of it and post it on their Instagram and Facebook pages. And really the point is here is spreading the word and educating the public about what this is doing, what's the purpose of these purple bins. And now when people start to recognize and know that this is for glass recycling, that lowers contamination. So you don't need someone there watching at all times. When the public start to learn and know and recognize what this is all about, that'll just lower contamination. And it does take time and it does take effort. You know, it costs a little bit on the marketing fee. Um, for a municipality, but it is absolutely worth it at the end of the day once the public starts catching on. Yeah, I'll second that too. We, we brand our glass only boxes with posters that have pictures and, and more graphics, less text generally seems to work better as a rule for us. So we put um, signage on there that shows what's accepted and what's not. And we've also gone so far as to configure the box itself so that 
uh, only what we're looking for will fit through the hole there. Uh, I think that was kind of a key for us is fly dumping is a big problem for us uh, in general uh, when it comes to walk up containers, uh, single stream especially. Um, the contamination level is extremely high in those. It's a little more difficult to configure a single stream box to, you know, uh, make it difficult to get uh, contamination contamination in there. But with these glass walk up boxes, we've had very good success in uh, keeping contamination out. I think that another question that kind of came up is uh, where to best uh, locate these. Uh, these containers, and I think uh, the, some of the answers in the chat was to put them at public works departments or uh, to put them at uh, uh, public stores, uh, you know, point of sales type uh, approach. And does anybody else have anything more to add on where the best strategic place is to put these uh, collection containers from glass? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add to that, and if people are worried about pushback from a store owner or uh, you know the the Walmart manager, um, we actually have seen an increase in foot traffic in the store, which would make sense because if someone is needing to recycle their glass, so they have to come to the local Price Chopper or Hy-Vee or Walmart. Well, if they're already there recycling their glass, you might as well go in and grab a couple items that you are needing. And so we've seen with host um, host sites they'll actually increase sales and foot traffic within their store. So it's a good reason or a, yeah, a good reason to get a manager willing to have a roll off bin at their location. And I think uh, one more question to, I think it was directed to Richard was uh, whether or not uh, some type of a bottle bill might help uh, you achieve your uh, recycling goals. And, and going back to what just Josh just said, um, if you don't have a bottle bill uh, and you've got people being trained to take their bottles to these uh, uh, point of sale stores, maybe you don't need a bottle bill if you can get enough containers at these stores to, uh, to, to make a difference. So I don't know, Rich, what, what's your opinion on a bottle bill and, and trying to increase your uh, recycling rate? Well, you know, I think as far as whether or not, you know, the, the bottle bills, um, you know, have work or not, I think Scott did a good job of, you know, with data showing, you know, it's, it's kind of indisputable, the differences, whether or not Diageo supports those or not. Um, I am not the person to talk about that. I wish I could not to evade that question, but uh, that's a question for our legal team and uh, not me. So sure. that's how it is for a global company. Uh, but what I will, as far as the last part of the question, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people would. I mean, I think about it with us, right? I, I uh, take my plastic bags, I collect them in a box in my garage, and I take them to the mire by my house when it gets full. Nobody tells me to do that. It's just the right thing to do. You know, I, I, I know a place I can take them. It's really close. And I, I just hate the idea of those things you know, not that it, I think they're bad or anything. It's just that it's they, the, the nature of them. I mean, they blow around and it's just a nasty, you know, thing to put in the landfill when it could be uh, recovered and recycled. Um, so I just do it. I think I would, I think a lot of people would feel the same way if, you know, I could, if I could take my glass bottles somewhere close by um, and I knew there were getting, um, you know, all the benefits of it. I mean, I do obviously. But yeah, I, I, and I mean, I think people would do it. Um, it, it just, uh, a lot of it is education. I mean, we earlier, Scott talked about, uh, you know, what his material flow charts and stuff about what percentage I've even heard in the Chicagoland region. I've had some people tell me that it's more like 50% or more of the glass that actually people put in their bin ends up getting used as daily cover which is just sad, you know? It's like the people are throwing those in their bins. And I think if, if the general public realized that it was, it ended up back in a, you know, in a bottle or some other glass product, uh, you know, they, it would be, they would, you know, be disillusioned a little bit. So uh, I think I think if anything we could do to educate and, and make it more convenient, um, I think people will do it. Okay. Well, Marta, I think that kind of, is what I called from the different uh, 
questions that came in the box. So I'll turn it over to you because we're getting up to our uh, closing remarks time. All right, thank you so much. I wanna thank all of our speakers today. You are wonderful. I thought you presented some amazing information. And uh, I also wanted to give one last shout out to our sponsors who helped make this event possible, which is Owens, Illinois, uh, Foam Cycle and Strategic Materials. Uh, also invite everyone to join us next month for our residential electronics recycling seminar with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, which will be the third week of February. And uh, I invite anybody who is not a member to join us uh, and also, for all of you to know that we do have, which I put in the chat, a new committee that we've identified for glass recycling. And learning that we are only recovering 8% of our glass, that makes it even more important that we, uh, we get a working committee going to see what we can do in the state to address this issue, whether it's education or whether it's a way to look at the collection systems um, and uh, possibly the, the disposal of it, which shouldn't be occurring when people believe it's getting recycled. So, and uh, thank you. Oh, yes. And uh, Richard would like to put one last plug in <laughs> for joining <laughs> the, the Glass Recycling Coalition, yeah, we so, help. <laughs> which is very Walk reasonable. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Let us know if you have any questions. We'll see if we can find you answers if we haven't been able to answer you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, all.